Amen. It's good to see kids here today. They're leaving to uh, Children's Church. I want to thank again uh, uh, Sheila uh, for leading and her, her backup singer, uh, Lenny. Uh, I, um, I, amen. I can tease them, but uh, I don't take for granted the service that you all provide and and uh, it's just, it's all valuable. But uh, Lenny and Sheila, thank you so much for leading us in this time. Church family, this week I was struck by a comment that I heard from a respected uh, Bible scholar as he viewed the different stories that were as told throughout Mark's gospel as he, he, and he called them unique. And this is what he said, let me quote. It's hard to be consistent into falling into some kind of pattern week in and week out because they're so unique. Talking about each story, they're so unique, these marvelous records of historical events in the life of our Lord, end quote. Now, understanding the word unique certainly applies, uh, whereas the word unique can mean one uh, being the only one of its kind, unlike anything else. That certainly applies belonging or connected to, to one particular person, group, or place. Or thirdly, being remarkable, unusual. Each story is certainly all that. However, his evaluation of them not being very consistent was shocking to me because I see them as being very consistent. So much so that to me, one story leads directly into the other for the sake of emphasizing the life-changing lessons that we are to glean from Mark's gospel. I pray that you're already beginning to be blessed if you've been with us from the first chapter, but uh, there's plenty in, in YouTube land. But Jesus wants to teach us, friends, even through his disciples. The lessons that they struggled to learn are recorded for us to learn too. So what applied 20 centuries ago can still apply today because in most ways, humanity really hasn't changed a whole lot. Right now in Mark, we're in a period where Jesus is experiencing a wave of, of spiritual blindness from people that are both close and distant to him in almost every circumstance that surrounds him. Now, I'm not going to take you too far back, but at least last week, because, of, of, uh, because our services are online, as I said, but for last week, you may remember how Jesus left Galilee. Um, uh, excuse me, he left Gentile territory and sailed west to Galilee, a town called um, Dalmanutha or uh, as uh, Mark says, Magdala, where the Pharisees appeared to be waiting for him on the shore, waiting for Jesus as he embarked, disembarked off the, 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 the boat. And they demanded Jesus to show him a sign from heaven to prove his authority having uh, been come come from God. And Jesus being all fed up with these religious charades of them, just wiped his hands clean and he left them because their hearts were just too spiritually dark for him to waste his time with them any longer. They all, all they really wanted from Jesus was his death. Not long after that same day, Jesus wanted to take advantage of a teachable moment Uh, with his disciples. And so while they're sailing back across the lake, the Sea of Galilee, Jesus warned his disciples about the sinfulness of the Pharisees, that uh, calling it leaven because of, of how yeast so easily spreads throughout dough. 
He's using a, an illustration, an analogy there. Likewise, sin can easily spread so easily throughout us if we're not spiritually aware and in tune. Sadly, the disciples seem to think that Jesus, uh, his, his metaphor for, for leaven meant that he was talking about lunch because they didn't have any bread. Oh, it was sad. So sad, so disappointing for Jesus. And as a pastor, I understand that same experience sometimes comes from church. We, we weren't, they weren't spiritually blind necessarily because of evil, but they surely were spiritually immature, lacking understanding of who Jesus really was. Doesn't that sound remarkable to you? I mean, after, after living two years with Jesus, watching him, listening to him, walking with him, and you still don't comprehend who this man really is that you're walking with. And like I said last week, friends, here we are on this side of the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. And they weren't at this time. They weren't. So how is it that Christians today uh, behave and respond to Jesus as the disciples did in the boat as they were rowing across this Galilean sea? And today's message is called Open Your Eyes. Again, we're in Mark 8, verses 22 to 33. It is very consistent with the stories told last week from verses 11 to 21 and so on. You know, it's told by, of course, Mark, who, excuse me, who's told to Mark from who? The Apostle Peter, who was, of course, a part of Jesus' inner circle of disciples. So let's look at this passage together and surely uh, I ask you to pray with me that the Lord will open our eyes to who Jesus is and that we're ever changed by it. I'm reading God's word today from the ESV, Bible, English Standard Version. You may choose whatever is your favorite translation. The uh, Bible in the seats is an NIV, but to honor the reading of God's word, would you please stand with me? Mark chapter 8, beginning in verse 22. And it came to Bethsaida, and some people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had spit on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked him, do you see anything? And he looked up and he said, well, I see people, but they look like trees walking. Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and he opened his eyes. His sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. And he sent him to his home, saying, do not even enter the village. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say, Elijah, and others, one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days, rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan! For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. 
Let us stop right there and pray. Heavenly Father, after reading your word, I pray that it does saturate us, our mind. But Lord, we need to open the eyes of our heart and our eyes spiritually to see. This is not anything that we can do on our own. Your word says that it is a gift from you. But Lord, so that we may draw even closer to you to know who our Lord and Savior Jesus really is. Help us with spiritual illumination today. And I thank you for what you're going to do in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. The first point that I'm going to share with you is that Jesus cured blindness. But I want to draw your attention to the map where we see that, that Mark says, And they came to Bethsaida, and some people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch him. And moving to the end of that little course, it says, he says to the blind man, Do you see anything? Well, as you see on the map, then if the Sea of Galilee were like a clock, all right, then Jesus and his disciples sailed from nine o'clock on up to around 12 or one o'clock. Somewhere in that area is Bethsaida, which is where uh, Peter and Andrew's hometown was before they had moved to Capernaum, a very familiar place to them. And once again, just like the paralytic in Mark chapter 2 and all throughout the gospel, we find people brought the sick to Jesus for what? For healing. They had faith that Jesus' touch would make their friend see. And like these folks, friends, if we care enough for our lost friends as these folks did for their blind friend, then we will bring them to Jesus for the healing of their sins. Now, obviously, the blind man needed to be brought because he would not ever find Jesus on his own. And neither will your friends and your relatives if you don't bring them to Jesus. They won't find him. And Jesus took the blind man by the hand and he led him out of the village. That's significant. Why do you think he did that? Well, Jesus was going to heal this man, but he chose not to do it in front of the other people of Bethsaida. So he didn't want them to see a particular uh, outcome of the healing. So why such privacy for this miracle? Well, Jesus took this man out of view to where the only this man and his disciples would actually see what was about to happen. And as we have seen earlier in Mark's gospel, Jesus' healings always held more than, than one dimension. Like, for instance, Jesus healed the physically afflicted because he had compassion for them. His, his ever-ending love for them, his compassion in their state of suffering. Or secondly, Jesus' authority uh, from God to proclaim the gospel was backed up by his divine power to perform miraculous healing, such as curing disease and affliction and demonic exorcisms. And thirdly, it held a dimension that the miracles were intended to teach people either something about Jesus' identity or about something on the way that God worked. Now, this particular miracle here contained a message. A message not for the crowds, but instead it was reserved exclusively for Jesus' disciples. Now that's why Jesus only allowed the disciples to, to see this miracle take place. So friends, please don't miss the bridge from the story of the disciples' uh, spiritual blindness from last week in the boat to the story of the blind man today being healed. The first point on your listening guide to recognize is that sight is a metaphor for understanding. 
And though they had different kinds of blindnesses, the disciples and the blind man would be given sight if they would have faith. And Jesus seems to have placed a great deal of symbolic significance on his special handling of this miracle as if he were telling a two-part parable teaching that insight into salvation or one's spiritual life is progressive for faith converts, including his own chosen 12. So often when we're first saved, all right, we, we may first discover that Jesus is our Savior, and he is, praise God. But then we seem to grasp the realization in our maturity that Jesus is Lord. That we, we can't progress in spiritual maturity until we grasp that truth. So friend, let me ask you this morning, is Jesus Lord over your life? Second point I want to share with you this morning is that Jesus healed the blind man in steps. Step one, he had spit on his eyes and laid his hands on him, and he asked, do you see anything? The blind man looked up and replied, I see people, but they look like trees walking. Step one. Step two is, then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and he opened his eyes, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. It looks like Jesus' first attempt to, at healing this man backfired, right? I mean, do you think Jesus didn't get it right the first time, and so he had to go back and try it again? I doubt it. Jesus performed this miracle, or performed miracles far greater than this one, and he didn't have any problem with them. At first, this man received sight, but it was fuzzy. And then he received sight with clarity. So why did this healing of this man's sight take more than one step? I mean, there were times when Jesus said, go, and the, and the healing took place, right? This is the only record in scripture that Jesus healed in this manner. He did it for the purpose of, of, as a teachable moment, as he was trying to do last week in the boat, warning his disciples of the, of the dangers of sin as yeast spreading throughout dough. He was demonstrating here a valuable spiritual truth to his learners, to his students. But let me move on to show you just how Jesus planned to use this healing to teach his disciples. Point number three that I want to share with you this morning is that Jesus cured spiritual blindness in steps. And after Jesus healed the man in Bethsaida, he led his disciples away from Galilee and headed northward into a Gentile territory again. And that's what you see where the, the upper red uh, arrow, Caesarea, God bless you, Caesarea Philippi was named for Caesar Augustus by Philip the Tetrarch, thus became Caesarea Philippi. And along the way, Jesus asked his disciples at this point of that arrow there, who do you say, who do people say I am? And after a number of responses of who people speculated that Jesus was, then he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Who do you say? Peter answered, you are the Christ. And just as the man's physical blindness was healed in multiple stages by multiple touches from Jesus, similarly, the disciple's spiritual blindness would be healed this way as well. That the disciples' spiritual blindness required multiple steps for healing over time by multiple touches from Jesus. The step healing 
of this physically blind man provided a learning model, a teaching model, a visual illustration for the steps that Jesus would have to take to bring spiritual healing to his own blind disciples. So let's reflect back to last week where Jesus tried to warn his disciples about the dangers of sin. In doing so, he reminded them also about his power and about his ability to feed thousands of people virtually out of nothing. The disciples had personally witnessed all the evidence of Jesus' deity right in front of their eyes. But up to this point, they weren't seeing with spiritual eyes. What Meaning what? They didn't understand what they had seen. And they weren't able to be able to put all the pieces together of this massive puzzle. They were still blind to Jesus' true identity. Now, immediately after this, for the first time in the gospel, somebody put the pieces together and understood Jesus' true identity. It was Peter. In a flash of insight, it all came together. He finally got it. He confessed that Jesus was the Christ. Well, do you think Peter put it all together on his own? No. Let me take you to Matthew. The parallel on this, chapter 16, verses 15 through 17. Jesus said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Matthew adds in that little extra detail. And Jesus answered, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah. That means Simon, son of John. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. One of the great differences between the 12 that followed Jesus and us as his disciples, we are his disciples, amen? amen. Is that the 12, again, had not yet received the Holy Spirit as we have at our spiritual rebirth. They had not. Jesus revealed that this incredible truth that Peter had received came, that came out of his lips, however, came from his heavenly father, or at least the work of the Holy Spirit. And at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit would come down and permanently indwell these, these disciples. But it is at our spiritual rebirth that the Holy Spirit takes residence in us. Amen? Amen? So, if you are a true, born-again Christ follower, then the work of God should be actively in, uh, working inside of you at all times. Now, this wasn't the case at, the, at this point in the lives of the disciples. The revelation that God the Father gave Peter to proclaim that Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior of the world, the anointed one, was nothing less than a miracle. And just as the physically blind man's uh, sight was only restored by a miraculous touch from Jesus, then Peter's spiritual blindness could only be cured by a miraculous touch from God to open up his spiritually blind eyes. That way, Peter would be able to see the evidence of Jesus' identity and put it together in a way that made some sense. Are you with me? Amen? All right. So most of us would think perhaps that once Peter had his eyes spiritually open to see and understand the identity of Jesus, that he would get it right from this point forward, right? You would hope so. That's not the case. Just as the physically blind man's vision was fuzzy, until Jesus' second touch made it clear. Similarly, Peter's vision of, of Jesus as the Christ was still a bit fuzzy. So while 
He saw Jesus as the Christ. Peter didn't really see clearly what it meant for Jesus to be the Christ. Let me show you. It was surely, it wouldn't be until after Jesus resurrected from the dead that Peter was touched by Jesus' uh, hand again. And his fuzzy vision of Jesus as the Christ would finally be made clear. In verses 31 and following, the good news of Jesus Christ is revealed. This, this is... Let me read it to you again. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days, rise again. Peter confessed Jesus as the Christ, the anointed one of God. That confession is absolutely necessary for receiving salvation through the forgiveness of sin. And if necessary, that we, it is necessary that we profess Jesus as Lord when we lead others into spiritual truth. Now, Peter discovered the answer to the question, who is Jesus? The gospel immediately moves to answer a second question. What did Jesus come to do? And Jesus explained clearly that as the Christ, he came to be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, the scribes, and be killed. He came to die in our place on a cross, paying our sin debt to God. Now, we deserve death for sinning against God, but not just death of our bodies, but an eternal death of our souls. Friends, if that doesn't nudge your emotions just a little, then you just might be spiritually stone cold dead. More than that, Jesus would rise from the grave on the third day defeating death and the devil's hold on sinners. He spoke about this clearly, not figuratively, to avoid any fuzziness about what he was saying. And what did Peter do in response? Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. That's pretty confident, wouldn't you say? He told Jesus not to die. I hope you're already starting to think about this. He told Jesus that he is the Christ, but he told him that he needed to avoid the cross. Peter's vision of what it meant for Jesus to be the Christ was for Jesus to reign and rule, but surely not to die. Peter's vision of Jesus as the Christ was fuzzy. I mean, it was way off base. Impetuous Peter went from the mountaintop right here at this moment straight down into a deep, dark valley, confessing Jesus is the Christ in one breath and being scolded by Jesus uh, the next for having the wrong understanding of what it meant for him to be the Christ. Verse 33, Jesus rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Ouch. Yeah. Sounds harsh. Yeah. But remember Jesus' temptations by Satan in the wilderness as he was fasting for 40 days? The temptation that Satan laid on Jesus was that he would be king if he'd only worship Satan and thus avoid the cross. Yes. 
The cross was something that it wasn't something that Jesus wanted to do, but he did it out of love for our sakes. Amen. Peter wanted uh, Jesus to be the Christ, the king, but he, he wanted Jesus to be the Christ without a cross. And the temptation that, that Peter put before Jesus sounded just like what Satan was putting before Jesus when he was being tempted in the wilderness. I mean, that, that, that's why Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. Jesus wants us to get behind him. Surely not for us to get behind his adversary uh, uh, and your adversary, Satan. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And fourth point I want to bring to your attention is that spiritual blindness is cured in community. Many Christians are still a little fuzzy on what it means to be a modern day disciple. What is discipleship? Now, some see it as a church or a parachurch organization, a program. Perhaps a, a class one attends with a specific curriculum and, and requirements uh, such as memorizing scripture verses, reading devotions and periodicals, which are all good. And even the Sunday school model still follows that. But I believe that a more biblical view of discipleship is leading people to become more like Jesus. Wow, that sounds a lot like a phrase I heard once. Our mission is leading families to live changed lives in Christ. Do our programs accomplish that? See, a disciple is a learner, a student, but he or she learns best by following the master. Following does require hearing, seeing, and doing what the master has set as an example. And when Jesus says, go make disciples, he follows that by saying, teach them all that I have commanded you. He was speaking of how he taught his disciples. His goal was to make them to become just like him in their thinking and in their action. But the process takes a lifetime of consistency, a day-to-day -day walking, taking steps, learning from the Lord through God's word and preferably in the fellowship of other Christians. But there's more to that. Churches, of course, need ministry helpers. And we've got a few good ones. Sometimes, even as a new believer, one might have been taught that discipleship was more about a program than about a lifelong step-by-step -step process. And so they might resent even performing a service or a missional responsibility. Now, perhaps they're okay with a ministry service in church or such, but it surely doesn't cause their heart to skip a beat. Perhaps at first, ministry is not very thrilling to them. And here's what seems to be missing in a lot about what we're talking about in the developing a proper transformational discipleship, becoming Christ-like. I'm convinced that if one, was, if one immersed themselves immerse themselves, like in baptism, right? Under, complete, in God's word, they would fall deeply in love with Jesus. The more they love him, then the more that they would want to be with him in prayer and in the word. But they, and they would spend time with him, to talk to him, to listen to what he has to say. And that happens when we literally study the Bible, God's word. 
It is a supernatural spiritual experience, but many of you have not yet experienced this because you haven't yet invested your time wisely. That, that we, you know, we have a tendency to spend a lot more time these days watching TV or movies or the internet or some other kind of entertainment source. And what you absorb in your brain is more worldliness rather than godliness, rather than Jesus. It's all about Jesus, I heard. Now, if you believe attending a Bible study or a Sunday church service is, is really all you need to do, then you will get out of it what you put into it. You also need some OJT, or what I'm going to call is on the mission field training. Right, so my evaluation of Christians that, that hold this viewpoint for living the Christian life is that they have really set their priority bar way too low. Lower than what our Lord Jesus deserves. Their commitment to knowing Jesus, loving him, living for him as he desires in order for us to understand the fullness of life itself has been set way too low by us, by us. You know, people serve others without even being asked when service comes from the love in their hearts and not because they're coerced. You know, I can't tell you, friends, how much joy it gives me in my heart to see people serve within his church because their love for Jesus is what leads them to love him by serving others. Who was the greatest servant leader of all? It was Jesus. It was Jesus. Why? Because he truly loved people. And that's what the church is. So what I see in, in others is that they serve with gladness in their hearts. They're, they're doing what their hearts are leading them to do through service. Now, how does that happen? Well, they simply follow their master, Jesus. That, that's discipleship. That is discipleship. They learn from him. And as his disciples, and, and, and we are his disciples, they're now doing likewise. It's really not that complicated. And if it seems complicated to you, it's because someone else has made it that way for you. Your understanding of who Jesus is may be still a little fuzzy. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. But if, if recognizing that in you, the Lord wants me to help try to make it a lot more clear and uncomplicated for you. And that's why we're going through this. Now, our vision and our mission is based upon a biblical view of what Jesus expects from his church, his bride, our reach, teach, and minister pattern for discipleship through life groups is based upon a biblical model that we find in the book of Acts. Now, my goal for you is to understand a biblical view of church, of Christian discipleship, of what God wants to build a right relationship with you and all the people that you will then go share about Jesus so he may save them from their sins. We won't receive any spiritual illumination or achieve any spiritual growth or maturity if we don't properly apply ourselves to what Jesus wants to do in our lives and the transformation that is required to change us from worldly thinking to godly thinking. It's an ongoing step process, just as Jesus trained his 12 and we must have our eyes opened to the spiritual truth in order to keep our eyes fixed 
on Jesus. You know, when I quote Dr. Henry Blackaby, which I do quite often, saying that we must see what God is doing so that we can join him in it, you will never see what God is doing until you have your eyes spiritually opened. You surely can't join God in anything that you don't see him doing. Amen? Now, some people come to church and they seem to work really, really hard to, be, to try to curb their behavior on their own, by themselves, trying to create a new changed life. But the Christian isn't supposed to change their own heart. You know, if we could, we would have done it without Jesus. We wouldn't need Jesus. Jesus came to change our hearts, to make us like him. A disciple is changed the more he or she chooses to follow Jesus, to become like him. It takes time. It requires uh, discipline which is a form of the word discipleship. It requires discipline and commitment. And Jesus uses that time and that commitment and, and that discipline to reshape us into his image. If we don't apply ourselves, church family, we will never experience the fullness of his blessings. It's Jesus that brings the change but we must be involved in his time-tested process. And you can't age out. You don't retire from this until your heart stops beating. The process includes one, we are to become disciples of Jesus. And two, we go make new disciples. To be a disciple means to become a disciple maker. It's how Jesus trained the 12. So I invite you to open your eyes to this truth. His plan is the same for us today. Let's pray. Father, I just ask for a beginning step. If there's anyone here that is totally blind in the darkness of faith, I pray that even if the sight was made fuzzy, touch the eyes of their heart and prepare them, Lord, for a walk of faith and experience supernatural with you. For those of us here today that I pray for, pray over in their lives, if, if, they, if their understanding of you has been a bit fuzzy. Lord, we have to admit, sometimes we're a little confused by those parables. I'm asking for a work of the Holy Spirit to illuminate those of faith, to have a clearer understanding of who Jesus is, why he came, how much he loves us. And that he is Lord over our lives. Even if we don't make him Lord, he is still Lord. So help us to understand that miraculous truth and be changed. If there's anyone here today that recognizes their need for a savior and a changed life, Recognizing that we can work as hard as we want to, Lord, to change our life, but nothing seems to change. It's because perhaps they're working without the true power that is necessary to make change. And I pray that you would open their eyes today that they need salvation through the forgiveness of their sins that was bought and paid for by our Lord Jesus. Only he could provide that salvation from our sins. And Lord, uh, give them the boldness to do something about it, to proclaim you, to commit and surrender their lives to you. Father, give them the boldness to proclaim Jesus and give this church 
the sensitivity and the compassion to surround this person with love and help them to form the life of a disciple. I thank you, Jesus, for what you have taught us in your word and even through our personal experiences. I give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.